Hello and welcome to Press TV's debate. I'm Marzia Hashimi. Thanks so much for being with us. Well, the results from the presidential election in Taiwan points to the victory of the incumbent president, Tsai Ing-wen. She's won 57% of the vote. Now, she ran on the platform of independence and nationalism, whereas her opponent ran on a more Chinese nationalist platform. What does this mean for the future of Taiwan? What does it mean with its relations which, with China? Well, stay with us as we we take a look at this and a lot more on this debate. Taiwan's incumbent president Tsai Ing-wen has won the country's presidential election, securing a second term in office. Tsai, who is a member of Taiwan's Democratic Progressive Party, first won election in 2016 with 6.9 million votes. But this time, she secured more than 8 million votes to win a fresh four-year mandate. Her political party supports independence and a Taiwanese identity. In fact, Tsai asked her re-election bid on a pitch to reduce Taiwan's vulnerability to economic and political pressure from Beijing. The results of this election is the voice of Taiwanese people, it's the voice of democracy. The whole world hears it. China has always considered Taiwan as part of its territory. Although Taiwan's economy has grown during her presidency, exports have fallen and wage growth is slow. Tsai has also failed to tackle a key cause of high housing prices and the wealth gap, a tax system that fails to adequately tax property investors. However, her promise of giving Taiwan independence has won her re-election. China says Taiwan is part of its territory and must eventually be reunited with the mainland. Only few countries acknowledge Taiwan as an independent state. The dispute with China has left relations free and a constant threat of a violent flare-up. Critics of the Taiwanese president believe that by pressing on having independence, leaders of Taiwan are risking the island's fortune. Meanwhile, the U.S. plays an active role in the row. Back in July 2019, Washington approved the possible sale of a $2.2 billion worth of arms to Taiwan. China urged the U.S. to halt the deal, warning that it could harm bilateral ties. Tsai In Wang's re-election could put Taiwan on a rocky relationship with Beijing as she opposes closer ties with China and the One China Principle. I'd like to welcome my guest to the program and the Executive Intelligence Review, William Johnson, William Jones, sorry, out of Washington, D.C., and political commentator Jason Unruhi out of Niagara Falls, Ontario. Thank you both um, for being with us. Well, let's start off uh, in Niagara Falls, uh, actually with you, Jason. Um, your perspective on the significance in general of this election. Well, I think this sends a very clear message, not only to the international community, but to the domestic community alone uh, as well, that uh, Taiwan is going to take a more of an aggressive stance towards China and maintain its longstanding belief that they are uh, that they are the the real China. Uh, despite the fact that they have a very small percentage of the population and are no longer recognized by the UN as as actually being the mainland China. I think that this is certainly uh, represents a shift away from uh, warming relations with mainland China more towards the United States. Uh, generally in this situation, that's what that means. It means a move away from China towards the other primary power in the world. Mm -hmm. That would be uh, the United States. Uh, I think it, it definitely represents uh, a much of a shift in the consciousness of the uh, Taiwanese people who have uh, long been told that, that they are different from uh, mainland China uh, based on some uh, lofty political notions, uh, uh, even uh, to some people, uh, a, a degree of uh, self-believed uh, superiority, uh, you know, a, a, a very a kind of uh, a vague thing. But I think that in terms of dealing with the international relations, particularly as the situation between the United States and China, China continues to be particularly difficult given Donald Trump's trade war on the country, I think it's important for the U.S. to get as many allies on their side mm -hmm. to uh, try to give that demonstration of superiority over China. Uh, William Jones, your take on the elections and, and how that's going to affect things. You see Taiwan um, now, especially with the re-election of the incumbent president, trying more and more to move away from China and, uh, as our previous guest said, switching or increasing its relationship with the uh, United States? Well, it's, what happened in Taiwan was not unexpected. 
given the tremendous uh, campaign that has been uh, engaged in, uh, particularly with regard to, t to Hong Kong. And I, I, would look at, I would look at Hong Kong and Taiwan uh, through the same lens, uh, that the concern with many in the Western political elites is that China is now going to have a say uh, on a world scale in a different way than ever before. And so there is an attempt now to, if not bring China down, at least to delimit its power. And how do you do that? The large economy of China, uh, the rapid development of science and technology. Uh, you do that through, uh, through three things, through Hong Kong, uh, through, uh, through Xinjiang, uh, and, uh, and, through, uh, and through Taiwan. The destabilization in Hong Kong, which was directly supported and I think even micromanaged and choreographed uh, by uh, people here in the United States was uh, the first stage in this campaign to try and undermine China. And it was also coordinated with, uh, with Taiwan. There was uh, relations back and forth uh, between the demonstrators in Hong Kong and the Taiwanese. They were going to take uh, uh, Hong Kong demonstrators. If they were thrown out of, the, uh, of Hong Kong, they would uh, have a free space in Taiwan. And much of this was coordinated by the United States in order to create a ring around China. Now, what happens to Taiwan now? Well, do they separate from China? I think that's, uh, that's really not going to happen. Uh, China in Taiwanese investment and economic connections with, with China uh, and Taiwan are just of such a magnitude that if China uh, were forced on the defensive with regard to Taiwan, it would not only represent perhaps a military threat, uh, because China is still ultimately, if not in the short term, uh, committed to, uh, to reuniting uh, with Taiwan with the mainland, uh, there would at least be uh, economic repercussions. Mm -hmm. Now, will the United States come in and provide uh, the amount of investment and support needed for Taiwan to keep it afloat? Uh, if they're dealing with a, uh, a hostile, if Taiwan is dealing with hostile China, I don't think that's going to happen. The United States economy doesn't have that kind of power. And remember, we're thousands of miles away from Taiwan. We may try and treat this as uh, ultimately as some kind of an aircraft carrier, as uh, uh, General MacArthur used to say. Uh, but uh, facing the, the forces of, of China, both economically mm -hmm. and militarily, it seems to me that Taiwan has got the find a means of working together with China at some level in spite of the uh, independence call today. Okay. Well, what about that, Jason? We look at the economic side of things. Uh, in uh, two, 2017, uh, Taiwan and China had $181 billion um, in trade with each other. Um, couldn't China actually pressure Taiwan economically a little more? Um, you, <clears throat> you heard our previous guest, uh, William, talking about that, but uh, do you think it's possible? And, and, and why wouldn't it if it sees, for example, the United States trying to uh, have more influence over Taiwan? I think it's very likely that China will uh, exert some kind of pressure to one degree or another on Taiwan in order to uh, incentivize it to move away from the United States. Uh, I, I think that this has always been a very sore spot for China since uh, the beginning of the Communist Revolution, when essentially U.S. warships uh, cut Taiwan off from uh, mainland China and for uh, many decades used it as essentially a proxy force for a very long time. Uh, under the uh, what was then fascist government of the Nationalist Party was essentially ruled at the behest of the United States. And I think that that's always been uh, something of uh, a sore spot for China, and they would like to see that reunification. I mean, politics is a power game, regardless of uh, what country you're in. And when you have the two largest economies in the world fighting over uh, what is essentially influence, if not outright control, over a country like Taiwan, well, both countries are going going to exert that pressure. I think it's it's uh, a better question to ask which one has the right to do so or or which one is morally correct in doing so. But I can I can certainly say uh, that China has not backed down from uh, any aggressions by the United States and has certainly been willing to defend its own territory. It has insisted upon its own sovereignty and its right to, to reclaim uh, Taiwan 
as a part of the country and has continued to assert that Hong Kong is a part of China and, uh, uh, frankly, always has been, uh, except for when it was uh, purchased uh, by the UK. So I think that uh, China would be simply foolish if they didn't try to exert uh, some kind of force, uh, some kind of coercion to make what is essentially their own people and their own land mm. uh, part of them uh, once again. William Jones, your take on that. Do you see um, China actually exerting influence? I mean, we've seen what has happened in Hong Kong in 2019 and perhaps also had some influence over what we're seeing in Taiwan. At the same time, um, we haven't seen China really be very aggressive, even uh, in the situation in Hong Kong. Do you see them having basically no choice but to be a little bit more aggressive with Taiwan or not? Well, I think they will. Uh they will consider and probably are in the process of considering measures that uh, they would have to, t uh, to take, uh, not because of the election, but if uh, Taiwan at any point in time uh, would try to move towards independence. Uh, the question also is, uh, is the attitude of the United States, that in spite of the tremendous you know, trade tensions that have existed over the last period, I think there's a general attitude on the part of the highest levels, including the president himself, uh, that they would like to have a good relationship with China. So the question is, how far would they be willing to go if uh, Tsai Ing-wei uh, would decide uh, to move towards a referendum on independence or something similar? Uh, would the United States support this uh, at the point of actually creating uh, a rift, a major rift, uh, with China? Uh, I, I don't think that would happen. I, I think there would be also, those advisors who would uh, set a limit or draw a red line uh, for in any independence movement, because that would be a change of policy uh, with regard to, uh, to U.S.-China relations. Uh, this would really uh, abrogate uh, many of the agreements that, uh, that were signed. But, but, in but we have seen some change. Sorry to interrupt you, William, but, but haven't we seen some change? I mean, when, when um, Trump came into office, as far as with the United States, the policy that it's been going along with the one country, two system, um, immediately uh, contacting the Taiwanese um, uh, authorities and trying to make deals directly with Taiwan, um, and increasing as far as military um, cooperation between them and selling them various, I mean, isn't that in itself a change in policy by the United States? Well, if you remember also, uh, he, he backed off of that pretty quickly uh, after that, uh, realizing, I think, uh, the damage that, uh, that could be done for the relationships with, uh, with China. Yeah, the Chinese-U.S. relationship is the most important relationship in the world whatever you want to look at, economically, uh, politically. Um, and if, that, if there is a rift there, <laughs> the world's on, on the road to a very serious conflict. And most people in the United States, even among the so-called neoconservative crowd, uh, which are very much pro-Taiwan and anti-China, uh, do not want to take that to a point uh, that would, would endanger uh, the interests of the United States and the interests of the United States are maintaining an economic relationship with China. We're not going to decouple from China. I think people are very clear about that. So if we're not going to decouple with China, then we have to take consideration to what they also consider their core interests. And while uh, people play Taiwan, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, uh, at the point that there's an attempt to play uh, some of these uh, Okay, William, we're, we're having some, uh, we're having a little technical difficulty, a little audio uh, problem right there. So let me turn and get Jason in on this discussion. Jason, you talked about the moral ground. Who has more of a right? But I mean, does the United States care? And, and you heard our previous guest, William, say that basically um, the United States, he doesn't think it's going to cross that line in really um, dealing with China because the Chinese-American relationship is of such importance. Your take on that and how do you see it? I, I do think that's uh, probably a very correct way to see it. I don't think that the United States or China sees this 
as a, as a reason uh, that's that's worthwhile going to war over. I think that for the foreseeable future, Taiwan is probably going to try to please both sides in this situation. And that struggle between U.S. influence and Chinese influence in Taiwan is, is going to continue probably for a, a very long time. But if we were to really look at this from a moral standpoint, I think that the fact that the Taiwanese people are Chinese, they have historically been literally a part of China. I think that, that uh, morality certainly does stand on the side of the Chinese and trying to reclaim it as a territory. Uh, you, you asked the question if the United States cares about the, the, the moral grounds. I think that's uh, pretty obvious given the history of the United States, that the, the United States uh, not only has no concern for the moral ground, but it doesn't have any moral ground to stand on whatsoever we are talking about the, the US Empire a place that has invaded and murdered you know millions upon millions of people in order f for their their own profit uh, their own personal gain in order to maintain their own power so I, I think that uh, clearly the, the the moral high ground certainly does land with China but I, I think that uh, it, it, it is a conflict that really has no solution because the Taiwan is being pulled by uh, two giants. And as they say, uh, when the giants grapple, the earth shakes and everybody else will feel the impact of uh, whatever hostilities occur between the United States and China. So I think for the, for the foreseeable future, uh, Taiwan is going to be continued to pulled in both directions until at least one of the countries firmly wins. Hmm. Oh, what about that, William? I mean, torn, uh, being pulled in both directions until one of them win. What we have seen in this election, it seems that the electorate, at least uh, based on uh, the presidential vote, uh, going towards the United States more. Um, your analysis of the people, the Taiwanese people, and, and, and how did they get here? Because you heard Jason talk about the historic connections and that they're all one people. Um, but obviously, the Taiwanese do not feel that way. And, and what does that uh, hold for the future as far as direction and your perspective? Well, I don't know if they don't feel that way. Look, let's look at uh, some of the possible reasons or people voted the way they did. Uh, was it a vote for independence? Um, that's a, a questionable item. This was not a re referendum per se on independence. But of course, they were, they were voting in the light of what they had been seeing in Hong Kong. And obviously there was an attempt, you know, there was an intent on their part of sending a message to Beijing that this is not what they want. Does that mean they want independence? That's, that's still, uh, still a, a very uh, unclear question. I, both uh, parties, of course, they are Chinese. It is a, a very rich culture. There are 5,000 years there. The, uh, the remnants of the Chinese culture exist in the uh, uh, in the uh, Palace Museum in Beijing, as well as in the Taipei Museums. People speak the same language, they study the same classics. Uh, they are uh, also adherents, for the most part, of a Confucian ideology. That, that's something that's very strong and, and really is, is kind of inseparable. But what they are concerned about, of course, is what Taiwan would look like in any kind of unification. And that's, that's really not very clear at this point. Uh, uh, one country, two systems was supposed to resolve the problem, but the problems that it had occurred, that had uh, run into in Hong Kong, then sent you know some question marks to the uh, Taiwanese public. Because remember, before the Hong Kong riots occurred, uh, President Tsai was not in very good shape. She was not ahead in the polls, but that pulled her up. Now that was something very temporary and had a psychological effect on people. But did it mean that they wanted total separation from China? I think that's not the case. And I think President Tsai is smart enough to understand that she doesn't want to bring this to a confrontation with China. She wants to carry her own weight with regard to China. And she will do so because she won this, uh, this election. Mm -hmm. But I don't think she wants to bring it into a break. So this idea of being pulled in two directions, she's hedging, hedging her bets in many respects. And I think we may see some uh, some other changes with regard to our attitude to China as, as we move forward after this election. And Jason, what choices do you see uh, Beijing having at this uh, point in time in, in dealing with Taiwan? 
is the I think uh, for the most part China will seek a, a non-violent approach. I don't think anybody wants any any violence between you know the, these three countries, and particularly uh, given the very sensitive way the sensitive uh, situation that the world is in right now, particularly with the Middle East, that uh, any rise in hostilities is is not uh, not something to anyone's benefit. I for the most part I think there will probably there might be some tariffs. Some, uh, uh, de-investment from uh, Chinese companies, but I, I, I doubt there would be very much, to be perfectly honest, if really any at all. I think they would be. It would be more along the lines of a, a political thing, maybe the, uh, you know, that that very polite but firm way that the the, the mainland government tends to talk about issues, uh, sending particular messages to uh, Taiwan. But I, I really don't feel that there will be any. There will be much of a reaction from the mainland over this, and I think. Um, at, at least for the immediate future, uh, it will continue to be dialogue, uh, maybe at the worst of times, uh, a war of words. But I, I, I don't foresee any real hostilities okay. uh, be between the two countries. I, th I think it'll be fa uh, fairly calm. And on that note, I'd like to thank both of you being with me. That brings us to the end of the debate. Executive Intelligence Review, uh, William Jones, Washington, D.C., and political commentator Jason Unruhi out of Niagara Falls. Ontario. And viewers, as always, we appreciate you being with us on another debate. I'm Marzia Hashimi, signing off for myself and all the crew right here in Tehran. See you next time.